Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Melanin Margin. I'm your host, Quaviandre Williams. And I'm Daquan Wilson. And this is the talk show dedicated to bringing the marginalized to the spotlight and uplift the Black voices that will no longer stay silent. So let's get into this week's race conversation. There has definitely been an upward spike in the BIPOC movement in Hollywood these past few years, and this has sparked much controversy in how inclusivity should work in television and film. Now, one of the main issues we see surrounding this conversation is whether or not stories surrounding people of color should revolve solely around their culture or what their culture has to offer. Now, Daquan, I want to ask you, what are your thoughts on this? I think that it's it's definitely a good conversation to have and it's there's a lot of nuance to it but my immediate answer is like no like i think that when it comes to our stories like stories that are based on somebody's culture yes i want that to be shared yes i want to be able to see my culture represented on the big screen but i also think that relying solely on those stories can get a little tiring because it's mm -hmm. kind of like picking at somebody's culture, especially when it's people who are outside of the culture making those stories. And so, you know, there's just some times when I want, you know, like this story about love about black gay people. And it's just that you don't have to get into like the black community and how they get um, along with gay people. You don't have to get to like coming out trauma and all of that stuff, like how powerful it is just to see a normal story but having your representation there, I think that's so powerful and something that needs to happen more. Yeah, I fully agree. I think that there has, I've seen it oftentimes where like, you know, we'll see the Mulans or the Pocahontas or the Princess and the Frog. And, you know, a lot of the time these movies, you know, are so deeply rooted in the culture, which is great. You know, we all want to make sure that we showcase those cultures. But like, when you look at, you know, stories like Cinderella or Snow White or, you know, the sort of Beauty and the Beast and stuff like that, like, it's not so rooted in that culture as much as it is rooted in the storytelling. And I think that sometimes mm -hmm. that over-reliance on the culture of the community versus just the community as a whole can sometimes feel like laziness. You know what I'm saying? Because if we look at specifically The Prince and the Frog um, and we look at that storyline and we look at the fact that it's, you know, based in New Orleans and the voodoo magic part of the culture, it's kind of like it really does feel like they are trying to use what they feel like is the most entertaining element, because I think I wouldn't have as much of a problem with it if it was more like, OK, you know, this is other aspects of the culture just uh, littered through the movie. Right. But when we look at um, we look at Pocahontas. And we look at Mulan and it's like we see the dragons and the we see the the armies and the da -da -da's and all that good stuff. And, and Pocahontas, we see the um the colors of the wind and we see like nature talking and moving with her and stuff like that. And it's kind of like, while that is an aspect of some Native American cultures, that's not all that their culture is. You know what I'm saying? Like it's right. not just it feels very like cherry picking, like the mm -hmm. most entertaining element of it while not while not letting it just exist. Does that make sense? Yeah, and honestly, that's a slap in the face. That's like your culture only has worth when we can make it entertaining. Your culture yeah. only has worth when we can make some profit from it. And like that's disrespectful to the people who culture it comes from. And I think that more and more we need to be able to like have black stories that are black stories. Like I think about a lot of 90s sitcoms where you would see, you know, Black people just existing. Yeah, there were a lot of different, like, racial connotations, and you got deep into, like, Black culture and different things and the nuances of that. But when you think about shows like Living Single and The Parkers, like, at the core of it, it was a Black people existing. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can look back now and, like, have different types of critiques and stuff like that, but that is something that I feel like we need to revisit once more. Yeah, I think that there's definitely a lot of nuance there because like when we talked about this before on the show about like having a shows that have nuance, you know, or movies that have nuance in them because I think that oftentimes it once again it feels like they're using the quote unquote best elements of the culture as a crutch versus um versus you know 
literally giving it to, uh, telling a good story you know and i think that like you said before it just it does kind of feel problematic when it's like okay we're only seeing what's we're only seeing what's exciting about it like ooh voodoo magic and even in those stories there are so many problem problematic elements like the fact that in Princess and the frog like mama odie is essentially the mammy minstrel and you know um they're showcasing voodoo culture as a practice and not a religion because it's a whole faith system and it just focuses on the dark elements to it and that's also another conversation altogether about how voodoo is seen or voodoo religion is seen as something that works with the devil or evil when the devil doesn't even exist in voodoo voodoo um the voodoo religion you know there are both cores and people who work with dark you know darker um spirits but like you know, there's a lot of this Christian ideology put on it that showcases any other kind of religion or any other kind of fascism as, as kind of a darker one, especially ones that come from African Americans. And so when we look at, you know, the Princess and the Frog and we see that kind of like the idea that, you know, yes, this man, yes, Mama Odie is a cool, a good character, but she is falling into the mammy stereotype. And then we look at, you know, Mulan and everybody's like, Mushu was an incredibly racist character. I talk, uh, in the Asian community, we're talking about that. And Pocahontas talking about the story was not actually accurate to what actually happened and her ending up with a white man. And it's just like a whole, there are so many different levels of, you know, racism embedded in that because again, some of these stories are not there, there are not enough people within that community within those spaces to let people know hey you know i get that you're writing the story about us but understand there's a lot more nuance to our culture there you know what i mean yeah and i think that it's one of those things where it's kind of disappointing that there's like this tokenism when it comes to it like like you were saying before it's cherry picking different parts of it and it's like now it's like oh Here's Mulan. We have Asian representation now. Here's yeah. Tiana. We have Black representation now. And yet still it's like, there are so many different expressions of Asian culture. Like, yes. it's not just East Asians. There's Southeast Asians. There's yes. so many different types of people who are of Asian descent. There are so many different types of people who are from Black and African descent. And so when you have this tokenism where it's just like cherry picking one experience, one part of the culture, you are then erasing the rest of it or telling the rest of the culture that it's somehow lesser. Yeah, and I think that there's even another layer to that and the fact that like, you know, in this situation when people are creating these stories, oftentimes that's the only story they'll create. Have you noticed right. that too? Like when we see these kind of Disney princess stories or whatever, there is multiple different versions of a white princess. We've got Brave with her being, you know, in the in the Nordic tribes or whatever case may be in the, you know, Norwegian and whatever, whatever. Um, or wherever. I think it's like, I don't know what it is. It's some, some Viking. I don't know. I don't know. But like, yeah. you know, she has a different, her story is not just around her being a Viking. You know, it's, it's not just about being that aspect of it. We see Snow White, we see Cinderella, we see Beauty and the BCC, you know, Belle. There are so many different variations in white Disney princesses. But when we see like Princess Tiana, she's the only black princess and still is the only black princess now. Um, we have a Asian princess, yes, or unofficial, they call, they, she's unofficially the Asian princess because Mulan is not um, a princess per se, but like that's even, that's even the fact that there isn't an Asian princess officially. You know, like there's right. a lot of times what will happen is Disney or these major companies will create these TV shows that search that, that center around a specific aspect of a culture. And they're like, this is all that we're going to show. That's it. And it's like, it wouldn't, I, I think that what I'm trying to get here is that like, it's not so much a problem that you're creating the story um, that revolves around the culture. It's the fact that you're only basing it in that culture. And that's the only story that you're telling. Like, let's, let's use, uh, let's go back to the Brave example. Like in Brave, um, we're taught we're, it's it may be a little bit more in, embedded in Viking culture, right? But we also have Snow White. We also have uh, Cinderella. We also have you know all these other white princesses that showcase different uh, just just living life and being a princess, right? Or, or becoming a princess. But there's it's not about you know Snow White isn't about German culture and Beauty and the Beast is not about whatever whatever. But Brave was specifically about Viking culture. So like the fact that we don't have you know, it's nothing's wrong with Prince. Uh, there, well, there is a little, couple things wrong with Princess and the Frog, but you know, as far as there's nothing wrong with having Princess and the Frog being a story told with a black from a black perspective, and you know, the, the New Orleans, you know, gumbo, whatever, whatever. But the fact that she's still the only one we have, 
is a problem. The fact that in Mulan, all we see is that, oh, China fighting martial arts, which I think is another conversation too, because if you notice too, a lot of Asian representation, again, me and Daquan are not Asian, um, but I do feel like we have seen some of these things and we can notice some things about that. The fact that in a lot of Asian movies, TV shows and films that are in America, um, that are American based, um, it only focuses on Kung Fu. It's some kind of martial arts thing. And I, I mean, you can, I mean, you can count on maybe one or two, uh, maybe one hand, the amount of Asian movies that don't involve martial arts. If you can even think of one that doesn't involve martial arts. I don't think I can. Can you, Daquan? Yeah. Maybe I Crazy Rich like, Asians, maybe? I was a conversation with my friend about this the other day, and we were talking about, because they were, they're Asian, they're Chinese, and they were sh sharing, like, the story of how their parents met. And mm -hmm. we were talking about how, like, you often don't see Asian love stories. Like the only time you see like Asian parents who love each other is like maybe like crazy rich Asians or something yeah. like that, but very few representations. Exactly. And I think that's such a big problem because it's kind of like it's only basing a Asian culture in American society seems to be only valid when it has something to do with martial arts. And that's a problem. That's a very, a very significant problem. And I think that, you know, it even moves the conversation even further to the fact that, like, you know, do you think that even though we have moved, because we did see a lot of this happen before where people wanted to highlight people of color. Like, you know, as it in the early 90s, early 2000s, we had, like, Living Color and Martin, Living Single, Half and Half, the Parkers, Moesha, and so on. But I wanted to ask you, like, do you think we've shifted back to ignoring Black voices? Or are we, like, like, are we going to a... Are we are we are we highlighting them more now, or is it just kind of in a weird space? I'm asking. I don't, I don't know. I think it's in a weird space. I think that <laughs> Hollywood is just like they'll be like Netflix will be like spotlighting black voices to like you know do something. But again, like that's just tokenism. But I also think that it's a conversation about like who's creating the shows. It's like yeah, when I think about you know Moesha and the Parkers and all of those shows, like. The majority of them, if not all of them, were created by Black people or had, like, some Black person who was, like, heavily influenced on that creation team. And I think nowadays, like, yeah, we see Black creators being able to get certain spotlights, but a lot of times when we see representation of people of color in general, they're white showrunners or white creators yeah. who are doing it. They're the the uh, white people are the ones making the final decisions on the final calls on the storylines and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that there's a, even a, even further going to that. Like you know, this even brings up another question. Like the idea that I think that there should be a quota. You know, I think there should be a certain type of amount because I feel like if you're writing a show about a culture that you are not privy to or that you don't understand, I think that there should be people in the room from that culture telling you whether or not your story is falling on racist undertones or, you know, problematic stereotypes. And I wanted to ask you, like, do you think that there should, do you think that too? Like, do you think there should be a quota of how many people of color are in television shows, even not, even not regarding um, people of color stories, but do you think there should be a quota of how many people of color should be in uh, television shows, author pools, writer's rooms? Like, you know, what do you think? I think that there should be this idea that there should be representation. I'm not so, so sure about like the whole quota thing because I think yeah. that, in the arts, it's a lot more qualitative than quantitative. So, like, I yeah. can just imagine, you know, production companies abusing that and being like, we're going to take the most, like, watered down, like, conservative Black people we know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And put them right. in those pictures. And it's like, you have the representation. We have these Black people. Yeah. But it's Black people who all have, like, the same perspective, the same background, same experiences, and stuff like that. So, I think that. There needs to be some type of wealth and I wealth of experiences. And I don't think that just having numbers will give that for a show. Yeah, I think it, it, and it's hard because it's kind of like, where do we start? You know what I mean? Because, of course, we know that there is definitely that argument of like, you know, people can't abuse that. And like, you know, you can, you know, it's like, even though you might have black people in there, do you have good black people? You know what I'm saying? Or do you have a whole bunch of Candace Owens and something like that? You know, so it's a it's a little like it's a little. Uh, but it's just, I think that there needs to be a starting point somewhere. I think that there definitely needs to be, I definitely do believe that when we're talking about stories about people of color, that people of color should be in the room. 
I think that's definitely yeah. the first step in that conversation. And while I know that, that there's a there's a level of quality and stuff like that, you know, at least if we have people of color in those rooms or in those spaces, it'll make it a lot easier for, um, you know, quality people of color to get in those spaces as well. Because, you know, hopefully in our community, we can start breaking down those barriers and breaking down, like showing what homosexuality should look like on television and stuff like that. And so it's just, it's such an interesting conversation, but I do think that it does start with opening up that door. I think that it does start with saying, okay, listen, this is a problem and we need to have people of color on the room. Not saying like, once again, if we look back on that, uh, um, on some other uh, recent stories and stuff like that, like, you know, you want, in order to help, uh, combat, you know, relying on such negative stereotypes and such negative, um, such uh, basically small areas of storytelling. I think that having those people of color in those spaces will help, you know, mitigate some of it. Maybe not fully, you know, correct it. That might take time, but it'll help mitigate some of that um, fallout that we see. Right. So transitioning into our next topic, we're all aware that the American media has an immense effect on the perception of races in other societies. So Quavi Andre, I wanted to ask you, do you think that it is the responsibility of show creators and production companies to ensure that the stories they create don't fall into those stereotypes? Absolutely. I 100%. I think um, specifically there was this, uh, conversation I saw a while back about Q-Force. I don't know if you heard of it on Netflix. And like a lot of the mm -hmm. times I would see um, there was a lot of stereotypes in that show. And one of the biggest problems that people had with it, you know, wasn't the fact that it was gay people on the show. It was the stereotypes that they use within the gay community, like the twink who only does drag and who doesn't have anything, you know, doesn't is not really as smart as other people or the goth kid who doesn't really, who's, who's the... Um, the goth emo person who is the hacker and stuff like that, the black girl, the black lesbian lady who's twice the size of the men and stuff like that. And so it was very much so, you know, relying on some heavy stereotypes in the show. And I think there's something to be said about creators, even if you are a part of that community, you can still reinforce negativity. You can still reinforce mm. negative stereotypes. Does that make sense? I think that we oftentimes, because a lot of times the conversation was like, well, it shouldn't get that much hate because blah, 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 blah. And it's kind of like, well, no, I think it's not about hating. I think it's about recognizing the fact that even if you are a part of a community, patriarchy, homophobia, transphobia, you know, um, all that stuff is embedded within our society. It's in the fabric of our, you know, communities and stuff like that. And even if we are aware that it's a problem, it still is sometimes so subconscious that we don't even realize we're creating those stories uh, that reflect such negative stereotypes. Like for me personally, um, when I, as a writer, I, um, what my, my biggest thing as a writer was to be a lot more inclusive in my storytelling, right? That was mm -hmm. my biggest thing. I was like, that I wanted to be the change that I wanted to see in television. So I wanted to create stories, not just for Black people, but also having Asian leads in my story and, you know, um, all kind of different races and, and creeds and, you know, a, a disabilities and stuff like that and all that good stuff. And I realized I was writing, a, I was uh, getting the premise for a story that I was going to write, right? It was a, um, this episode about an Italian character. And the first thing that came to my mind was like, ooh, he's going to be a gay person who's going to be in the mob and his family was a mob, da, 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 and whatever, whatever. And I just went and I was building the whole story about it, right? And then I was just, something just told me. It was like, Google Italian stereotypes. And I was like, well, okay, let me try it. So I went to go and Google. I was like, am I being stereotypical here? And it was like a whole, uh, met several articles that said the problematic undertones of writing Italian stories centering around mob um, culture and the mafia. And I just was like, oh my goodness, like I didn't even realize as an African-American, as someone who is oppressed in our society, I didn't even realize that I held some of those um, stereotypes and prejudices in my head. Um, and it might not be something I might say, oh, I don't like Italian people, not my dad. A prejudice is necessarily as outward thing. It can sometimes be just simply thinking, uh, believing stereotypes or believing some things about a story. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. I didn't even recognize that I had that in me. And so of course I reevaluated and I was like, okay, just like then I had I had to take myself out of, you know, the shoes of somebody like, oh, I just want to create diversity. I was like, okay, create a story and make the character Italian. Create a good story and make the character Asian. Create a good story and make them uh, make them this or that and the fourth. Stop thinking about the stereotypes because once again, your first mind is society. The first thought you have is society, and it's the, and it's the homophobia, transphobia, racism, all that stuff embedded in there. But your second thought and your first action is your fault. 
That's your responsibility. So before I put pen to paper, before I put my finger to the keyboard, I was like, hold on, let me do my research because I'm not a part of that community. And let me see if I'm reinforcing those stereotypes are reinforcing something that I don't even, I'm not even aware might be something that's a problematic element. And because I did that research, I was able to recognize, oh, wait a minute, I held some of that in me. I held those negative stereotypes without even knowing it, not consciously aware of it. Because of course I'm not out here going, oh, I don't like, you know, being, you know, rude or, or prejudiced towards Italian people, but right. reinforcing that negative ideal is a problem. And, I, and it was something that I was able to go out and say, realize, oh, wait, I'm recognizing that's a problem. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think that absolutely as somebody who's writing a show or producing a show, directing, whatever you are doing, it is your responsibility to make sure that you are not painting these characters as just stereotypes. It is 1000% mm -hmm. your responsibility to create shows and create experiences for people that are not just solely relying on stereotypes. Because if I'm being honest, that's just weak writing. <laughs> like, you know, like when I was a creative writing major, one of the biggest things that I learned was that the best writing and my best writing came when it was like unexpected. Like, yeah. I live in New York City now. So if I was like describing the city, I could easily say something like the Big Apple or the Concrete Jungle or yeah. the city that never sleeps. But those are all super predictable. But if exactly. I said something like, I don't know, the land where dreams come to die under starless skies or blossom amidst subway cries. That's such a different and more nuanced description of New York City. Because A, mm. it's broader. Like you mm. can't immediately be like, oh, that's New York City. But then you think about it and it's like, hmm, maybe they're referencing gentrification, how some people mm. come in here and flourish despite the infrastructure of the city being, you know, crying out because of that. Or maybe it's like, oh, so many people come here with these big dreams and then become pawns to capitalism. And like, that is so much more than just like the stereotypical depiction of New York City. And I think that's why it's so important as a writer, as a creative to go outside of the box and not rely on stereotypes because you get something that's so much more rich and entertaining. Yeah. No, I fully agree. I think that there is something to be said about it. You know, it is lazy. It's lazy to just go about what is already quote unquote known about a certain community. It's lazy to go about, well, Asian people, Asian, uh, 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 martial arts, martial arts, there we go. Or, you know, um, uh, 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 Asia uh, or um, Native American people going straight to reservations and, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's just like, there's just so much more nuance that I think is um, not really put towards um, creative fields that we're seeing, especially in the more um, the more mainstream ones. And I want to ask you, like, do you think, you know, speaking about stereotypes, um, do you think that all stereotypes about marginalized people are bad no matter what? Or can those stereotypes be accidental? Like, do you think this should be eradicated in film and television altogether? Like, do they serve a purpose? Like that's, I guess that's what I'm asking. <laughs> right. I'm going to take the hard stance, cut all the stereotypes out because <laughs> there is no way a stereotype cannot be negative or have yeah. some type of negativity con connected to it. Because even things we would think about as like positive, like, oh, Asians are good at math. But like, if you really think about what that stereotype is saying, it's Asians are only good for productivity. Asians mm. are only good when they're showing some type of intelligence. If mm -hmm. you think about, oh, Black people are good at basketball, like, sure, you know, being having a skill is great, but that's just saying Black people are only worth it when they're entertaining us. Exactly. Or, like, I remember seeing on TikTok somebody was talking about, like, oh, like, I was getting my house built, and, like, as soon as they started speaking Spanish, I knew it was going to get done. And it's, like, then you're only saying that you know, Latino people are only worth it when they're putting in hard work. And that just allows you to exploit them even more. So no wow. positive stereotype is good or worth it in our society. So we need to make sure our media are not per perpetuating any stereotypes at all, regardless of whether you see them as positive, because they're not. Yeah, I think that there is definitely, you know, I think it's all about nuance. 
I don't think it's all about nuance uh, because we let's not, you know, we all are aware that there are some Asian people that are good at math. We all know there are some Asian people who are good at martial arts. We know there are some black people who are good at basketball and stuff like that or whatever, whatever. We know that, you know, some of these stereotypes are based in some some as some very small aspect of a reality. But I do think that there is something to be said about how you choose to represent that. So it's not so much um, if you're creating, if the, the first thought when you create a story about a black person shouldn't be about um, uh, them playing basketball. But if in your movie, your, your character is, uh, does like basketball and it just happens to be black. And I think that's where, I think that's where the problem comes is that like a lot of the, in a lot of these movies that we see, you know, when we see white people who like math or white, like, like Good Will Hunting comes to mind or stuff like that. Like, you know, it's not some big, oh my goodness, you know, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're white and they like math. You know, it's not like this, you know, or like, it's not, it's not a big to do. And I think that's the problem that we have is that. While, you know, it's, it's, it is something like, you know, um, like I said, it, having a story where an Asian person may have a martial arts skill is not a problem. It's the fact that that's the only story you're telling. And again, right. the story that you're telling is oftentimes not written by an Asian person. And so the, and it, and it starts to create this negative idea. And like, I fully agree with what you mean. Like, as far as, are there good stereotypes? No. And in the eradication of them, I think it's a little difficult to eradicate stereotypes as a whole because, unfortunately, once again, they are based in some truth, not completely, but they are based in some truth or in some aspects of it. So, like, while again, you know, um, there is a, there, like I said, there are several African Americans who um, can, uh, who are good at basketball. That does not, that is not, a, we are not monoliths. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. just because some of us are good at it doesn't mean that all of us are good at it. Good at it. Just because you know, um, some uh, just because Asian people, this Asian person might be uh, into math, doesn't mean that all Asian people are into math. You know, and I think that basing, I think the problem is when they start to base the story around the stereotype and reinforcing, like he's black, you know, he's gonna be great at basketball, or he's Asian, you know, he's gonna automatically know kung fu, or he's you know uh, Native American, you know, he's gonna obviously know how to do the um the uh, reservations and the in the in the healing thing or whatever the case may be. So I think that it's just that understanding about the fact that in these situations and in these story in these the story these storytellings i think that it's incumbent upon us especially as you know people within the community creating stories about our communities to not rely so heavily on stereotypes that will oftentimes have a negative impact because we know what happens when uh, people think that all black women are aggressive we know what happens when black all people think all gay people are sexually promiscuous, you know, and it's like, you know, while it is once again, while it is a person of color or a LGBTQA person making the story about whatever they're making it about, it can still be damaging. And I think that recognizing that damage and understanding, okay, do I have to make the gay character promiscuous? Do I have to make the bi character greedy, quote unquote, you know, like people want to call them out in, in, in media or whatever or stuff like that. So, I mean, it doesn't make sense, Saquon. Am I, am I making sense here? Yeah, you totally make sense. And you said something interesting that I want to talk about of just like this idea of like there's some type of truth in stereotypes. And I also want to propose like there's a lot of times when those truths then come from the stereotypes. So thinking about something like, Ooh. you know, there are a lot of black basketball players who play well. Yeah. But if you think about where the stereotype of black people being good at basketball comes from, it's a longer history of just like black people being seen as being able to work more and being built to oh, you know okay. all of these different okay. things. Or even just like Asians are good at math. Like, you know, that kind that stereotypes come from so many people not wanting Asian people to come to this country unless they were bringing something. So they had to be these great mathematicians and professors and stuff like that just to be here in this country so i think that there's this like interesting duality or just like yeah of like life imitating art and then art imitating life and just like vice versa with stereotypes imitating life and then life imitating those stereotypes i'm so glad you said that because i as soon as you said that's the first thing i thought about was art imitates life i think that that and i think that that's where it comes in again where it's like you like we just talked about like why it's so it's easy to write about 
uh, Asian person being good at math, or it's easy to write about a black person being good at, at, at uh, basketball or Asian person uh, being a martial artist. But the reality is, unfortunately, like you said before, because that's what we are seeing, it oftentimes reinforces the idea that that's all we can do. And so when you're a black kid watching television and all you're seeing is movies about us playing basketball or us being a sports or athletic, that automatically makes you think, well, that's the only thing I can offer as a African-American. And like you said, as Asian people, that's they feel like that's right. all they can. So I, I see what you're saying. It's like the idea of like the snake eating its own tail kind of thing where it's like, if you keep creating stories that reinforce this negative stereotype, then that's going to keep making people, unfortunately, sometimes uh, fall into those quote unquote stereotypes because that's all they, that, that seems to be the only way that society or at least American society accepts them in. It's the only role yeah. that American, or excuse me, let me, let me say the realty. It's the only place, it's the only um, area that white society will accept you in. And so if you're going to be black, you need to be good at a sport. If you're going to be Asian, you to be good at this. If you're going to be a Native American, you have to be good at this. And I think that, like you said, it's just about that understanding that in life, when we do, it's like you said, it's lazy. It's lazy in general. And it's, it's, it's a part of a bigger problem. So I think that Hollywood and the media industry is a business. And therefore, most executives look at everything through what we call green tinted lenses. And as long as the algorithm they've been using when they create movies and films still churn out money, they don't feel any need to fix said inclusivity. Now, this begs an interesting question. Uh, Jaquan, do you think that the BIPOC movements are profitable enough for them to actually care about in order to make a systemic change within how stories of people of color are actually portrayed? I think that it's one of those things where no, not yet, but maybe mm. soon. I think that it's one of those things where I don't think it will ever be profitable enough, like being able to profit off of BIPOC movements, because I think that at the root of BIPOC movements is that we just don't want to be a profit to you. We want real authentic stories that are like genuine to our interests being told and not tokenized. Yeah. But I also think that as BIPOC movements grow in Hollywood grow and we really, you know, affect their pockets, maybe it's not profit, but then it's losses. And so then they have mm -hmm. to grapple, are all of these losses worth ignoring these stories? And so I think that's when they'll be like, all right, you know, like you said, when we were talking about like Sneakerella um, a while ago, like once their pockets start hurting, then they're going to start listening and be like, oh, we can't just ignore them anymore. We got to do something. Yeah, I think that honestly, I think when it when we look at some of these stories and we look at the people who are taking these stories in, I think there's definitely something to be said about understanding that, you know, because it's one of those things, it's, it's such a weird, it's such a weird place because on the one hand, we do know that black dollars can be enough to sustain people. There are so many people out there who are like, you know, especially back in the day, people were like, baby, black dollars is enough for me. I don't need the white dollars. Right. I, mean, I, I, I can, my black, my black people got me, you know? And I think that's a lot of, in a lot of different communities. Um, but I do think that there's just, there's this level of like, because there are so many stories that we see, especially in the mainstream movies and films. Um, let's specifically talk about uh, Shang-Chi, right? And, you know, again, furthering the stereotype that Asian people are martial artists, right? But we also see that it was very well received. And, you know, yes, we have people who are critiquing it for the obvious reasons, but it's that same thing of like, if you don't go to support the movie, does that make the people in the execs think, well, the reason why they didn't like the movie was because it was Asian people as leads. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like when we look yeah. at Black Panther, and we look at, you know, that storyline or whatever, it being in Africa and them having the accents or whatever the case may be. And while that's, you know, it's a part of our, you know, culture, whatever the case may be, but it's like falling into that same kind of like, you know, it tribal aspects of Africanism, the tokenism of that cultural aspect of it. And it's like, if Black people didn't go out to watch those movies and tried to protest the fact that it was made because it was relying on the idea that we know, again, we're only valid if we're either tribally or something like that, or we're doing that or whatever the case may be, are we... Would they see it as being like, well, because it, the reason why I didn't make any money is because it was a black lead. 
And so it's re it's in a, such a weird space because we've seen the um, overwhelming outpour of happiness we saw at seeing Black Panther be what it is. And the fact that it was dark skinned people of color as leads and showcasing the story and really, you know, shutting it down. But then it's like, OK, now that looks at Disney execs. OK, make more stories like that. Versus right. understanding that the reason why we were so proud of Black Panther was because of the representation, because we don't have that as much in the mainstream media. So I want to ask you, Daquan, do you think that that's do you think it's kind of a, a double edged sword of like if we don't support those movies? Will the reaction simply be, oh, they don't like it because it's an Asian person? Because it's not just Black or Asian people taking in those stories. It's also white people coming to watch it, too. And so do you think yeah. that it's kind of a double-edged sword there? Yeah, I 100% agree with you. It is a double-edged sword. It's one of those things. And I think that goes back to our conversation of just, like, why it's so important that, you know, we have people of color, BIPOC folks who are in the decision-making chairs because you know, the people who are making this decisions, they're just going to look at, you know, maybe race numbers and stop yeah. there, numbers mm -hmm. and stop there. They're not going to be like, okay, yes, this was a black movie, but like, did we depict blackness wrong? Did we exactly. do X, Y, and Z? They're going to be like, it was a black movie. It didn't work. We're not making it again. And like that's, you said. And that's such a, and it's, and it's, it's so messed up because it's almost like we have to tolerate the misrepresentation, or excuse me, rephrase the um the culture vulture aspect representation that we see sometimes, in order to get more stories told with Asian, Black, Hispanic, Latin, you know, stuff like that. Like because when we look at, like I said, the Black Panther and the Shang Chi, and it's like you know we this is the first time that we've seen an Asian person lead a major Marvel film in however many years that it's been out. Uh, how many years um, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, Marvel has been making movies? It's the I think it's the first time that we've seen a eight right. Am I right or wrong on that? One? I think it's the I think I think, I think it is. So. It's the first time. Just like Black Panther was the first time a black person was leading the lead of the film, not just in the movie. Because if even if you look back on the um, you know, like um, X Men, you know, we yeah, have we have Storm, but like she wasn't the lead. You know, she was in right. the movie, but she wasn't a lead role. It was Wolverine, and so like. It's so crazy how it feels like we have to just kind of accept that misrepresentation in order to hopefully make these people think, the white people think, oh, okay, well, they like the blackness, so we'll keep the black going. And hopefully be like, well, we well, we don't have enough people to write about black movies, so let's bring some black people in. And hopefully, you know, it's it's like we have to take if we have to take they have the crumbs to hopefully build some bread kind of thing and it's such a weird it's such a weird place to be in and i think that's where it comes into like you know everybody's like always saying um well why don't you just create your own why don't you just create your own and it's like well of course we are well of course we are we are yeah, we are like that's that's been that's not something like there are several asian people who are making asian comics and asian stories and something like that for if there are several latinx people who are making or latino people who are making you know um stories about Latino stuff like that. And there's there's plenty of black people making plenty of black representation in like superheroes, stuff like that, or whatever the case may be. But the reality is the most known and the most uh what am I looking for? The uh, mainstream. Those 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 books and comics and stuff like that are not as mainstream as the Captain Americas and the you know uh black uh the um the uh, other stuff out there and like these bigger communities like Marvel and DC got the superhero game on lock. It's just the fact. It's just a fact. Right. And it's like everybody's like, and unfortunately, we have to kind of in these other situations with the most mainstream stuff, it's almost like we have to kind of deal with it in hope that this support for these films will hopefully make people like Marvel and DC go, okay, let's start bringing in some more some more some more color. You know what I'm saying? Even thinking about the Suicide right. Squad with having it just Elba be the lead. You know the Suicide Squad and having the original Suicide Squad with um with uh Deadshot being uh, um being Will Smith and stuff like that, like just showing like you know it's sad that we have to do it that way, you know. But it's almost like we kind of have to take steps to hopefully get some more room. But hopefully, you know, stuff like this. I, I really what I'm really hoping happens is that eventually lesser known stories and like lesser known stories about people of color start to be put, put as mainstream as the Marvels and DCs. Why is it only Marvel and DC? Why is it only Disney making these big old animated movies? 
You know what I'm saying? Why is it only these ba major white networks like, you know, Disney, uh, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, you know, stuff like that, that are the one are the, the, the mainstream as far as that? Like, why don't we have more, you know, people of color stations, you know, the stations that are made like not just BET, but more more than just that? You know, why is there not more so that we can and why is that stuff not put as far to the forefront as these others? You know what I mean? Right. Or even when we do have them, having something that's going to stay strong and stay black yes. instead of, you know, selling out and like, you know, starting as this like black owned, black created company and then eventually either becoming like a child company to this larger white network. Yes. You know, creating something that's truly going to stand on its own as a, you know, person of color owned industry. Yeah, and I, I wanted to ask you too something because I don't know if you remember um, back during the uh, protests um, going on about George Floyd and when, you know, we had that big uprising that, that happened all across the world. And I just wanted to ask you, do you remember when those, when Hollywood was incredibly responsive to that? Like, you mm -hmm. know, we would see the, I, I remember seeing this cartoon on Cartoon Network, this commercial with this character going like, you know, uh, they only dislike this person because of their race. And that's a problem. And the Steven Universe thing where the girl was taught, like basically preaching to the class about why racism is bad and stuff like that. And it's like, it was you know, that slow, and then people are like, and then Disney was like, uh, a couple of companies are like, oh, we're going to start uplifting people of color. We're going to start, you know, bringing in, you know, that kind of thing. And it felt very performative because when mm -hmm. we look back at that and then look at now today and look at just how much change has been made since then, it's like you said you were going to hire more uh, Black animators. You said you're going to hire more Black stories and more Black shorts and more Black stuff like that to be able to let them do these things. Yet, we're not seeing it. Why do you right. think that Hollywood is only responsive when there's global unrest like that? I think that it's, you know, the only time when they're really forced to do something. I think that so many times we have all of these different movements happening and then it's like, all right, things start to die down. We're like, all right, we did this. We're good. And we're going to move on. And, you know, there are people who allow them to move on. There are people who are in those places who are allowed to move on. And I think that, again, it goes back to this conversation about having people of color in the room, because when these instances of injustice happen, when it's happening to your community, you can't just move on because it's still happening to your community. But when it's a white person, it's like, okay, the protests have stopped. They're not right outside of our door, you know, protesting and stuff like that. So we can move back to normal. I fully agree. And I think there's even a level to it about the money factor. I think it goes back to the money because they recognize that there is a, uh, they recognize that they want those black dollars, especially back then. And they want those, they want those black dollars. So they're like, Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do that. Wink, wink, wink. We're gonna do that, and then then they'll get those uh, that kind of up spike in you know black uh, black people taking in their content more because now it's like oh well they said they're gonna do this, and I think it's I think the problem that we're having with that is accountability. Mm -hmm. I think that while we did um, while we did give we have the uprising did um, did open up some people's eyes i do think that we are not cons i think that we are not consistently trying to keep holding these tv shows uh these networks accountable it's like okay you said you're going to create more black stories where they at fam you said this almost a year ago where are the new where are the new black stories coming up what's happening what's i'm happening sticking here? Yeah, where's where's where it at? Where does I think that that's the problem? I think it's happening is that you know oftentimes the the, the you know what what does it say? I think it was like um, uh, black lives still matter even though it's even though it's not in your feet all the time. Is that how it went? What was that? What was that? What was yeah, that? How it went? I think something like that. Yeah, and it's like it, it's still important to have that representation, even if you're not seeing us say Black Lives Matter and it's trending all the time. Just because it's not trending doesn't mean it stopped. Just because we are not, like you said, outside of your door saying, hey, Nickelodeon, make more Black people stories or people of color stories or, hey, Disney, stop being fucking racist. Even though if we're not doing those things, um, even though we're not, you know, right outside, like you said, right outside your door, it's still a it's still a problem. And we're still not seeing it. And I think that it's just like, it's it's always like, and I think this comes to 
the systematic issue at hand because right. it's like there is kind of a pushback right against this glass ceiling or there's this pushback against this kind of um what, what we should be doing and what is happening right and we push and we push and we push and we push and we see a couple of cracks and we're like okay it's gonna fall but then white people go back and repair it Mm -hmm. These execs go back and repair those cracks. They're like, okay, they cracked the ceiling a little bit, but we still got it. We still got it under control. You know, yeah, they were mad, and we 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 um we placated them. We placated black people. We placated people of color to make them think we're gonna make a change. Wink, wink, wink. We're gonna make a change, <laughs> but we're gonna. We're but gonna then, do it. They, we're gonna do it. Sure, of course, of course, girl. And then as time moved on, it was like, oh no, honey. Um, we were just playing. We were just joking. We just want to keep y'all off our asses for a second. And now they're going back to doing the same things that they've been doing before. So I think it's just, I think it's just about understanding and recognizing, like you know, if we if we hold these people who claimed to um, uh, say Black Lives Matter and claim to showcase Black entertainment more accountable for it, I think that's when we would see the real change. But of course, we would need so much more. We would need so much more. Um, uh, power behind that in order to do it. And I think that is if 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 it's not affecting their pockets, they ain't pressed about it. Right. A accountability is so important, but that's a whole nother conversation. We can talk all about accountability later. So let's move on. Now the table is always hot with current events and social issues, but sometimes the heat can get a little intense. Let's turn the temp down, take a breather, and get into this week's topic, cool down. So for this week, I wanted to know, Quavi Andre, mm -hmm. what is something that you find unexpectedly attractive? The, I am so glad you brought this question up because recently I have had a whole adult moment. As a kid, there was so many things that I thought was hot. Like, you know, ooh, they have the six pack abs and the da 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 da, they're like, you know, funny and they're you know charismatic and all these other you know these kind of surface level things and then as an adult i was recently talking to this one um guy and you know i realized that like there are other things that i think are more attractive than just the surface stuff like for me specifically a level of support is necessary in a relationship mm -hmm. for me and it's um, the specific person I'm talking about. We were talking for a second and like I had told them, I was like, hey, by the way, you know, I, they were like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I, my, my job is this, but my career and my passion is, you know, I have a talk show called The Melon Margin. I have my own YouTube channel. I write, stuff like that. And they were like, oh, okay. And then like never spoke about it again. Never yeah. talked about my videos, never said, you know, whatever. And I was like, for me, I was like, that's necessary. I didn't realize until that time where I was like, you not asking me about what I'm doing you not saying, hey, babe, I subscribe to your channel. I can't wait to see what you do next. Or, hey, baby, you haven't made a video in a while. What's going on? Are you okay? What's going on here? Or, hey, I watched this Melon, I watched Melon Margin last week and I thought it was so entertaining. That was such a great conversation you had. You know, stuff like that is, that's, that's hot. That's hot to right. me. Like that kind of support from someone and that kind of thing, I didn't realize it was something that I wanted. So that to me is was one, one of the things that I thought was like, I didn't think that was, that was something that was going to be attractive to me until I didn't have it. Mm. you that's, know that's so interesting and i i agree i think that you know that's one of the things that you don't necessarily know you want until you don't have it or you <laughs> had it and you lost it yeah. um but i think for me something that i didn't really expect to be super attractive that i'm now just like is so attractive to me is men in makeup i think that it's one of those things where I, you know I'm going to be honest, this question was inspired by your TikTok when you were talking about how, like, in the gay <laughs> community, you know, we have this thing of, like, femmes aren't supposed to be attracted to femmes. And I, yeah. you know, for a while, I had this thing, like, oh, you know, I'm starting to get into makeup, like, and I see somebody else doing makeup, and I'm like, oh, we can't be compatible because, like, we're not. But yeah. I think that that's why it was so unexpected. But then I really thought about it and I really like deconstructed those thoughts. And I was like, there is something about, you know, that combination of just like masculine and feminine energy that comes with it. Not saying that like makeup has a gender because makeup has no gender, but yeah, there is just like this way of expressing yourself with makeup that is feminine. 
And I think that that balance between masculinity and femininity is something that's so attractive in somebody who's can do it well. And I also think that as somebody who experience, experiments with makeup, I've realized that like people who wear makeup are bad bitches. People yeah. who makeup will not make you a bad bitch, but awaken that Ele inner elevates, bitch. yeah. And elevate it because like I know when I put on a beat and I'm really feeling it, I'll just like look at myself in the camera, I'll start posing, you know, <laughs> get the light hitting the highlighter yeah. real quick. Yeah. And it just like creates this confidence in me that like was in me, but just like needed something to bring it out. And I think that especially now when you know being a man who wears makeup is so stigmatized, or even yeah. women who wear makeup are also stigmatized, but like in general, like having that confidence to do something against stigma, that's sexy. Oh yes, and I think I think there's like confidence, but also I think there's something, cause I think that we're talking about is confidence in it too. Like that, that like mm -hmm. I know who I am and I'm gonna do who I am, that kind of thing. Right. But I also think for me, another thing that I thought I didn't expect to be like really attractive until again, this partner, the, this, you know, situation I had and I realized they didn't have that. And I was like, oh, that's something I need. Because for me, passion, is sexy and not necessarily sexual passion, but like someone who is passionate about something. It is just, it gets me going. And I didn't realize that until I was talking with this person and they were like, well, I don't really know what I want to do. And I'm just kind of like going through the motions in life or whatever. And I was kind of like, this is not hot. Like that's not sexy. Mm. And it's like, I didn't realize why I was like, what the, what the fuck? Well, like, what is the problem here? Like, well, I mean, cause they were really funny, really nice. But I was like, that just, it just turned me off. I was like, what do you, you know, like, and I think it's because I know how excited I get when I talk about writing, when I talk about, you know, when I do this show, when I do my own talk show, when I do my own uh, YouTube channel, like it just, it feels so good. And like, you want to see that. And it's, I think it's the passion and ambition. And it's like, mm -hmm. even if you are working at McDonald's, but you're like, listen, babe, I'm working at McDonald's, but eventually I'm going to own my own McDonald's. I'm working towards owning my own. I'm going to become the general manager, then originally the regional manager. And I'm, I'm making efforts to do those things. Like not just saying like, it doesn't matter what you're doing, but it's like someone who's like, listen, this is what I'm doing right here. Yeah, I want to be a rapper, but I still go to work every day to get my coin because I know I got to get my bag this way. But I also, when I come home, I go to work. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like that shit, ooh, like that, just like seeing somebody who's like not just going, not just somebody who's going like, oh, I'm just going to go by the motions or, oh, I'm, I want to rap, but I also, you know, I just, um, I want to rap, but I'm just, I'm just doing it on the side and I'm, I'm doing it whatever. Like seeing someone who's like, listen, I know I'm going to get my bag and I'm going to fight for it. And yes, I got to work this regular job right now, but I'm going to work this fucking job, but I'm going to bust my ass every other day to get what I need to get to in my career. That kind of stuff to me, somewhat seeing someone that ambitious, that passionate about something, because to me, I think for me, the reason why I need that in a relationship is because when there are days, especially in a creative career where you falter, where you need a person, uh, kind of an accountability buddy, kind of sort of, where it's like, yeah. what are you doing? And you're like, well, I'm just having a rough day. It's like, okay, you can have a rough day. I'll let you have that. Tomorrow, get back on your shit. You know what I'm saying? Like somebody's right. gonna check it out. Like, like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're right. Hold on. Like, you know what I mean? And it's like, because I think that in life, you know, you, you need that, you need that kind of, you need someone who's gonna be like, I always say, like, I want a partner who's like gasoline and I'm fired. We're gonna keep building each other up. And so it's like on the days where you're lacking or you are, you're like just having one of your dark days, like I don't know what's going to happen. I'm like, hold on, baby. Okay. I understand. Let's go through those emotions because those are absolutely valid, but I need you to get your ass up tomorrow and get it back on your shit. This is what you're supposed to be doing. Right. You know what I'm saying? And the same thing for me. And so I need, cause I, cause that kind of support, that kind of ambition is just sexy. You know, it's, it's just, and having that person who's going to keep you, who's going to keep checking you and say, Hey, listen, what you doing? You gotta, you got you gotta, you gotta get up on bestseller author. What are you doing? You gotta become a. You gotta get this talk show together. What you doing, sis? You know what I mean? What do you right. think, Daquan? Like, do you think I, that's kind of? I I agree. I think that <laughs> like I am a Capricorn through and through. Like Capricorns <laughs> are ambitious, and so I need somebody who's going to match my energy because like at the end of the day, like I'm going to be moving and grooving and moving on to the next thing and like trying to work myself to where I want to go. And yeah. if you're just like stuck somewhere and you're okay with that and you're complacent that's not going to help me or even just like thinking like logistically about a relationship like if i'm super busy trying to grind to make it to where i want to be in life in in my like creative interests like i need somebody else who's 
also grinding and also has like their own life so that you know they're not just like codependent on me and always yeah. like trying to tag along with me when it's like you know i love you but i gotta do what i gotta do and like i'm not always going to have that super amount of time to just like stay in one place like i need somebody who's moving and grooving just like i do exactly it's it's a relationship which means you're supposed to be building each other up not tearing each other down and i think that in a degree in a way unfortunately dating someone who is not that ambitious dating someone who is not as passionate as you may be y'all are in two different places in your life and that's not going to work you know what i'm saying yeah. i think that that's where it comes to just understanding like this you need to under you need to be with someone who's on the same track as you and so that way y'all are building each other up y'all both have goals ambitions dreams y'all match the um, energy exactly your destinations your paths align even if they're not in the same direction even if i'm trying to be an actor writer dancer whatever or whatever wherever i'm trying to be and you're trying to be something in a more practical field like a doctor or whatever case it be even if i have a completely different even if let's say for me i'm a writer and my, and my boyfriend is a um uh, uh trying to be a doctor we're that's still passion and it's like listen baby what you doing you got to study you got to study tonight you got to test tomorrow let me get you together like right. let me quiz you real quick or me or like i said when i'm having my ba my days hey babe what you doing oh uh, you, you shouldn't be writing right now shouldn't you be writing what you doing right here you, you feeling you got that? that audition coming up let's run some yeah. lines <laughs> let's run some lines <laughs> so i think that there's just a, flu a fluidity that has to go on in a relationship and i think that there's something to be said about that and i think that that's that's sexy that's a sexy so um shifting gears here um so many children grow up never knowing the full scope of what their culture has contributed to society and history. So it's time for change. Let's take a pause, rewind, and remind the world just how <laughs> we did that. Now, in the article, 26 Black Americans You Don't Know But Should, we learn about Rose Marie McCoy. Now, McCoy's name may not be instantly recognizable, but she wrote and produced some of the biggest pop songs in the 1950s. Now, in an industry dominated by white males, McCoy was able to make her mark through her pen, even though she couldn't through her own voice. Her songs, after all, and Gavin Blues never quite took off on the charts but she was always courted by music labels to write for other artists, including hit singles for Big May Bell, Elvis Presley, and Big Joe Turner, to name a few. So now, when you hear Presley's trying to get you, you'll remember the name of the African-American woman who wrote it. Mm. And that's on period. <laughs> period. <laughs> Black women. In the music industry, anytime there is super white success there's some blackness behind it i just don't know about it oh <laughs> well, that's a conversation for another, another day, day. <laughs> so for my we did that i want to highlight edith spurlock samson who was one of seven children born to a middle class family in pittsburgh pennsylvania after being encouraged to become a lawyer while attending nyu school of social work she studied law at the John Marshall Law School and graduated with a law degree. She then went on to Loyola University Law School in Chicago, where she became the first woman to earn a Master of Law degree. Sampson then founded her own practice in 1934 and was one of the first women to argue in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. Sampson became the first African American to be appointed to the to a permanent U.S. delegation to the United Nations in 1950. Sampson went on multiple worldwide lecture tours while working at the UN and was a member of the U.S. delegation to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, also known as NATO. Sampson was elected to the Chicago Municipal Court as a judge in 1962 at the age of 61. Mm. With that election, she became the first Black woman elected to the bench in the United States by popular votes. <laughs> Black women constantly raising the bar and doing it flawlessly. Period. Period. <laughs> now, as 
always, thank you all so much for watching. And please keep the conversation going down in the comment box down below. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. And if you're listening to us on our podcast, please rate and review on whatever platform you're using. Now, if you want to follow us on social media, our handles are at Andre Talks A Lot and at Daquan950. You can also follow our podcast on Instagram at the Melanin Margin for updates of new content. Now we'll see you all next week on the Melanin Margin, where conversations about race <laughs> are never off the table. Goodbye now.